Uh, my name is Hans van Dijk. I'm an associate professor at the Department of Organization Studies um, uh, from our university, um, School of Social and Behavioral Sciences. And I'm very happy to um, moderate, host this uh, session on uh, altruism. Um, we are going to hear uh, great speakers today. So we have uh, three great speakers who will talk about altruism and volunteering from three different perspectives. Um, they will talk each about 20 minutes, and after that there's about five minutes for uh, questions and answers uh, from their side. Um, after the first two speakers, we have a break of five minutes, uh, no, a break of 10 minutes even, and then there will be the third speaker. And after that we have uh, four representatives from four student organizations. So we have the, the Red Cross Help Desk, we have uh, Serve the City, we have Vida Fidei, and um, we have, let me briefly check, Fraxi Sam, yes. Um, they are going to explain a bit more about their organization also when they are standing here and then uh, we make it more interactive. We have some statements, some discussion points to discuss with them and with all of you. Um, and all of that together will take about 22 uh, hours. Um, in total. Uh, two hours. <laughs> two hours. But we can also make it 20 hours because I think we have enough uh, material to discuss uh, with all of us for so long. This session is also organized by the four student organizations together with Studium Generale uh, here from, uh, from the university. Um, and of course, this session, we have great speakers, great input, uh, fantastic content. So all of that will be good, but it will be even better if all of you will also mingle in the whole discussion. Uh, so I really hope that you will also actively participate. Uh, that would also make my job easier, I may add. Um, just, just for a very brief introduction and understanding, uh, who of you here is engaged in voluntary work, does voluntary work? Yeah, okay, more than half, I think, yeah. So a big question I think that we're asking today is, why are you doing that? Or for those of you who are not volunteering, why are you not doing that? Um, or why are the others doing that? Actually, in preparing for the session, I have also been wondering myself, like, okay, in the stuff that I've done, why did I do it, you know? Um, sometimes it may sound very nice, okay, you know, I'm helping refugees or something like that. Um, but at the same time, am I really doing it for them? And does it cost me something? Or is it actually that it also benefits me? Because it helps me feel good about myself. Uh, I, I, I feel good, like, oh, let me see me be a good person. Or maybe I get inspiration from it or I repress my guilt of having a good life away from it. Uh, so what's actually the reason why I'm doing that? And, and those feelings, are they actually okay? Uh, those motivations, are they okay? Well, we have some uh, great speakers who hopefully can help us enlighten a bit more about that topic. Um, speaking of which, let's first go to the first speaker, uh, Felina van Overbeke. Felina is a uh, researcher, a teacher, and a speaker also. Obviously, um, so she works at the Rotterdam School of Management, where she part-time does her PhD on uh, volunteering, um, with a special interest in volunteer inclusion and third-party volunteering. And um, she is going to talk about the values that we gain through volunteering. Yeah. So please give it up for Feline. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, I was just saying that uh, thank you for already asking like two or three of the questions that I was going to ask um, and, and giving away half my presentation, but we're, we're just going to do it all again. <laughs> Hi everyone. So my name is Felina van Overbeke. Usually I introduce myself, but this time I don't have to do that um, to start with. And today I'm super excited to be here because this is the first time in years that um, I'm actually speaking somewhere else than at my own university, so that's really cool. Um, I will talk to you about the value of volunteers, which is the main theme of my whole PhD uh, research. But before we start uh, about the value of volunteers, I wanted to talk to you about what is volunteering, actually. So volunteering is kind of an action that comes together when we have volunteer energy, which comes from 
the people themselves, the volunteers themselves, when they have the capability, the willingness and the availability to volunteer and volunteer infrastructure. So that's the opportunities to volunteering. For example, all of the things that volunteer organizations can organize to, actual, um, to actually start the volunteering. And I promise to talk a little bit about volunteering in the Netherlands today because you're not all from here. Um, and the Netherlands is a real volunteering country. Um, we have a lot of volunteers here, as you probably read before we started. And we usually describe volunteering along about four different um, sets. And one of them is, um, <coughs> sorry, uh, whether it is mandatory or not mandatory. And in the Netherlands, people really feel that volunteering should be not mandatory. Because the word is volunteering, right? Not voluntolding, as some people uh, also say when volunteering is mandatory. They also see it as being definitely unpaid, getting nothing in return, not even a cup of coffee, maybe. Although in my experience, and I don't know what yours is, most volunteers will expect that cup of coffee at the end of their shift. I think. Um, what some of my friends were doing uh, the, the counting of the votes yesterday, and one of them said that she was promised pizza and she did not get pizza afterwards, and oof, she was very upset. <laughs> Another thing is that it needs to be organized. So we see volunteering as something that you kind of know in advance that you're going to do it, you're doing it with an organization, and maybe even structured. So for example, every Friday afternoon from three to five, you will go to a certain organization to serve tea to elderly people. And then the last thing is that Dutch people think that volunteering should really benefit others or the broader society. Now, some people think about that a little bit different. As you can see here, there's a pure interpretation that's definitely how the Dutch see volunteering, the very pure, pure um, interpretation. But there's also a broader interpretation where, you know, it's okay if volunteering is a little bit obligated. For example, when we're talking about, I don't know, did anyone do that thing in high school where you were supposed to volunteer for a few, a few hours a week for a couple of years? Yeah? Do you, do you remember where? Okay. And what did you do? Okay, you still call it volunteering though, even though it was mandatory, right? Yeah, okay. So that's, that's kind of what obligated volunteering can be. And then in the broader interpretation, you can also get a little bit of a pay. It's funny because in the Netherlands, people perceive volunteering as having no pay at all, but it's actually one of the countries where you can get a stipend for volunteering. Um, so people actually do make money here volunteering. And then the structure can be informal in the broad, broad interpretation and the volunteering can also benefit the volunteer themselves, which is what we will talk about a little bit more later as well. So these are the numbers about volunteering in the Netherlands. And I think this is pretty impressive. About 40 to 50% of the Dutch people volunteer and they volunteer like four or five hours a week. That's one of the highest numbers in Europe and even in the whole world. Can I, can I see the hands again of everyone that, that does volunteering? Yeah, so that's even more than 50%, um, which I guess makes sense because a lot of you are here through the volunteering organizations, but still. <laughs> um, what we also see here is that the volunteers are on average a little bit older, mostly around the age of people that have kids that go to school. Why? Any ideas? Money. It's, it's, it's a nice thought, but not exactly the one I'm looking for. Someone in the back. Yeah.
that's a very altruistic thought. Yeah, also not the one I was going for. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Their kids go to school, and then the parents go to the school to pick up their kids, and then the teacher finds them and says, hey, you know what? We have a school outing next week. Will you volunteer? Come with us to the zoo, please. And then they bring their kids to ballet or to the hockey club, and then the people there are like, hey, we need parents to attend the bar, and we need someone to drive them to the game. Can you please help us? So that's why that age is really highly represented. So... Estimated volunteer hours a year, very, very many, about 700,000 full-time equivalents. So that's, that's really a lot. One of the places where people volunteer a lot is in the food bank. <coughs> and I'm, uh, the only reason I'm saying is this is because I want to have the food bank as an example for you uh, during the rest of this presentation. So, so many volunteers, why do they do it? Well, so many volunteers here, why do you do it? Contribution to society. Nice. Any other answers? Personal fulfillment, nice one. You can learn something from it, that's a nice one. Som sometimes you have to. <laughs> okay, so when it comes to reasons why people volunteer, there's usually about seven, uh, no, six, sorry. I miscounted there. Um, so one of them is, for example, by, uh, it's, it's called values. And what they mean by that is that you can really, by volunteering, kind of stand up for what you believe in. You can really do something. Another thing is understanding, which means that you want to gain a better understanding of what the world is and what the world means. And then those two are really the more intrinsic or altruistic values, I would say. And then there's the social one. This could be the one where someone is like, hey, can you help me out? Because, you know, your kid is in this school, uh, so I want you to help me. And you can't really say no because social pressure. <laughs> Um, there's, but th also, maybe you want to meet new people. So another reason for social could also be that. And then there's, I don't know, career, where you want to learn some new skills, you want to do some new stuff, you want to put it on your CV so you can get that job that you want. Protective. Might be a bit out of, like, you might not know why it's here. Protective. How could volunteering be protective? Any idea? To your, let's say to yourself, yeah. Yeah? Not exactly what I was looking for. I would say that's more of a, of a skill, on, skill enhancement uh, thing, for example. I saw another hand in the back, yeah? I would say that counts more of a, as, as, as of the value component here. So protective here is really protecting yourself from maybe bad stuff that is happening in your life. So maybe you feel lonely at home, so you want to go out and volunteer. Or you're in a divorce and you just really want to get away from your almost ex-partner. Um, and you go out and volunteer for a little bit. And then there's just a regular enhancement, which is all kinds of things that will make you li your life better because you volunteer. So, so many volunteer hours. How do we value all of those volunteer hours? So, if we're looking at that food bank example, the food bank in the Netherlands has a lot of volunteers, almost 13,000. Could you imagine if all of those people were paid staff? That would be a lot of money, a lot of money. And that's one of the ways in which academics, but also practitioners, count for volunteer hours, is how they value them economically. 
but there's also a lot of other ways how the, <coughs> sorry, how academics kind of try to calculate that volunteer value. And one of them, for example, is the opportunity cost method, where they look at, okay, this volunteer that's working at the food bank, if they were doing their actual normal job, how much would they get paid for that? And then we check the amount of hours that they worked, and then we calculate the opportunity cost value. Does that make sense? There's a lot of ways to do this. And I'm not gonna tell you about all of them because I honestly don't think that volunteering can only be calculated in an economic way. Um, so that's why I would like to move on from that. Um, so with that, I already gave my answer <laughs> to my own question. Um, I don't think volunteer value can be expressed only in euros. It's a nice way for policymakers. I guess they kind of need it, but how else can we value volunteer hours? Well, one of the things that we do is we look at the value for the beneficiary. So if we look at that food bank example, then we're thinking about the people that go to the food bank. What does it mean for them to have the volunteers help them instead of paid staff? So one of the things that we know is that volunteers are a lot better in creating meaningful relationships with people. And that's partly because there's this kind of equality between them. They don't feel like there's someone always scribbling down what people are saying or thinking. There's also the idea of sincerity. And that's where that altruism that was mentioned already a couple of times comes, comes in. People feel like you are really here for me. You're not doing this for money. You're coming here because you know you want to help me, so you must be sincere. And that also creates a different level of trust. And then the quality of service is different, and that mainly has to do <coughs> with the fact that, you know, if you're a volunteer, no wait, I'm gonna ask the question first. You're all volunteers. You probably got some rules, right, when you when you started volunteering at the place that you volunteer at. Did you ever break them? You can be honest. <laughs> Did you ever break the rules that your volunteer manager gave you? No? Oh. Because what I've learned in my research is that volunteer managers, they give their volunteers the rules and then the volunteers say, yes, of course, we will do that. And then they will turn around and they will do it anyway. <laughs> and that can sometimes really improve the quality of service because the beneficiaries really feel like there's a better connection. And then there's a different form of continuity. But if you're interested in that, we can talk about it another time. Another form of added value is not so much visible in the food bank, because in the food bank, the volunteers are really working, well, actually not always. So actually also in the food bank, a lot of the volunteers do not come, they're not in contact with the visitors of the food bank. But still, there's a lot of value in the work that the volunteers do beyond that economic value. And a few of those things, for example, are, let's start with credibility, because the last time I gave a lecture about this was on Tuesday, and my students really questioned this. Um, so I wonder if you feel the same. The idea is that volunteers are more credible than paid staff when it comes to, for example, fundraising. Why? If I am at a birthday party, for example, and I'm talking to you, and I'm telling you, you know what, I work for the food bank. This is such an amazing organization. We help so many people. We're doing only great stuff. It's, it's really, really good. You know what, you should donate. And then after that, I tell you that the food bank actually pays me my monthly wage. 
do you still, would you still feel like donating? Or would you feel like donating more if I told you that I work there as a volunteer and I do that in my free time and I don't benefit from it at all? Maybe. I'm, you know what? I'm not claiming 100% truth here. Um, but yeah, I think I would be more um, inclined to leave a volunteer over a paid staff, especially when they come and ask for my money, because I would not feel like I'd be paying their wage. Okay, I, saw, I just saw that I only have two more minutes, so I have to, like, I always think that I have all the time in the world, and then, and then I don't. <laughs> I think one of the most important things here um, is talking about the added value for the individual volunteer. So for most of you, and in my belief, oh, I messed something up in my slide. Um, in my perception, these are very much linked to the, the vol those um, volunteer, voluntary motivations that we talked about earlier. Because if you volunteer, one of the values that you gain from that, for example, is that you can create more social life that you can enhance your curriculum, uh, your, uh, your CV, that you can, I don't know, do things for your career. So I think those are very important individual values. But of course, since most of you are um, students, I also wanted to focus a little bit on individual student volunteer value. Um, and just very, very quickly, because you are all volunteers, can you just shout at me some of the values that, that you create for yourself when you're volunteering? Friends? Nice one. Other stuff? Experiences? That's it? <laughs> Purpose? Nice one, sense of giving back. CV, yeah, I mean, it's an important one. So here are some specific student values that uh, were found in volunteering research. So it's basically the things that you already, well, you didn't really shout at me, you told me, So, but that's kind of nice. Um, so it's, it's a lot based on skill development, personal growth, things that you can add to your CV, um, but also social awareness building, and of course, always altruism and those kinds of values. <laughs> that was it for me. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Felina. Um, we have room for one or two questions. As I said, you being active is an important part <laughs> for the content of this program. Yeah, in the back. In the back. Just a second. <laughs> Let's do it like this. Yeah, so I saw the last uh, slide. There were uh, some things, uh, but you said there's also altruism, altruism um, because that's not on the slide. So is there also something like pure helping somebody else or, or or isn't that on the list? So this is a difficult question for me to answer um, because yes, in research this does always come up, but it's also always questioned if pure altruism is actually a thing. Yeah, because and I'm not gonna give the answer to that. No, this <laughs> just seems like some, somebody is doing this for himself or herself, right? Yeah. Okay. It's it's never just for themselves though. It's it's always a combination of this with helping others. But if we're looking at individual volunteer value, then yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Could you just tell us why you decided to research this or put your career to this? 
Um, if I'm going to be 100% honest, I kind of rolled into it. Um, I studied business administration, which you maybe wouldn't really connect to this topic, um, but I did a really fun minor in Rotterdam um, about social entrepreneurship and consultancy. And then the professor was a professor in philanthropy and volunteering. And uh, I started as a research assistant for him after that. Uh, and we started doing some really cool projects on volunteering. And then I stayed because I really liked it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so do you focus on um, the individual value or what, what exactly does your uh, research focus on or specify in? Right now in my research, I'm focusing on all of it, which sounds a bit broad, but um, uh, yeah, I'm now doing a literature review to, to see really systemically what has the, no, systematically has been the research about this in the past. Um, so there we focus on individual volunteer value, organizational value, beneficiary value, societal value, all of, all of the values. <laughs> yeah, but I, f I find um, individual value maybe the least interesting, to be honest. Um, value for me, value for beneficiaries and the nonprofit organizations is most interesting. Yeah, because I think it's most important. afraid we have to move on. So uh, thank you once again, Feline. <laughs> and hold on to those questions. We uh, may come back to them later. Um, so Feline gave us a management perspective. We are now going to switch to a more philosopher's perspective. Maybe that will also help in addressing the first question. Uh, so our next speaker is Willem van der Dijl Kloeg. Um, he uh, did his PhD in economics and philosophy at Erasmus University, so we have a connection there apparently. Um, but at the moment he teaches uh, uh, philosophy here at our university and conducts research among others to the value of work. And he will provide us with a more philosophical and ethical perspective on altruism and volunteering. So Willem, without further ado, um, please give a hand to him and good luck. Hello, hello. Can you, can you hear me? Is this, this is okay? And yeah, can I have the clicker? Yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. I, I think this is really great that so many of you are coming to this event about altruism. And I th yeah, because I think altruism is really, is really important. And I, and, I, and I also agree that maybe, so when people talk about altruism, it's often, people often talk about this, this idea about whether or not pure altruism could exist. But I, I don't think that's very interesting because I think there, there's, there's, we do things for other people all the time, right? And I think that's, that's, that's really great. That's one of the most important things uh, I think we, we, we can do. But I want to start today with a little bit of a, of a personal story. And, and I hope there's no hypochondriacs in here because this story, it's a personal story. It's something that happened to me. But it's, it's a little, it's not a great story. Uh, and it's something that happened to me in, in, in May 2020. Um, and, I, and I think, um, yeah, so, so maybe, uh, this, was, this was roughly seven or eight weeks into the pandemic, and by this time, I think I, I, I caught COVID while teaching in Tilburg uh, right after Carnival in 2020, uh, and I was recovering from this, and I, I wasn't feeling all, 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 all too well, but at this point, I had no idea that anything at all could be seriously going wrong with me. So it was a Friday afternoon, and I, I started, uh, I, wa I wanted to go for a jog, as I would sometimes, sometimes do, um, and after that, I don't remember anything anymore. What I do remember is that I woke up in the hospital. Um, there were, were tubes in my, in, 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 in my, in my nostrils, and um, I, I was learning that I had been resuscitated. Because apparently while jogging, I had, I felt I'd, I'd fallen. Somebody had seen this, but at that, right at that moment, the reason I had fallen was because I was going through a cardiac arrest. And I didn't, so I didn't know anything would be wrong with me. But as it turned out, something was really quite wrong with me. Uh, I had a genetic heart condition. And there's a lot known about this heart condition. And in fact, a lot has been developed. We have learned a lot about this, this, this heart condition. And, and in fact, one of the organizations that, that does a lot for this is the Dutch Heart Stifting, for instance. And so the, the Dutch Heart Stifting, the, the, the heart funds or something along those lines, is 
It's doing a lot of great work, and, and one of the things is that, is that it, it saves lives by, by putting AEDs, you know, defibrillators, in different spots. So for instance, if you're, there, there's one that's very visible um, at, the, at the Tilburg University train station if you're going into the direction of Breda. Um, and, and these things save lives. So I think they cost about 1,500 euros or something, but for every um, 15 or so, uh, eventually one life will be, will be saved. And, and it's due to things like this that people like me uh, can, can live to tell the story. So in my case, I was, I, was, I, was, uh, I, was, I was lucky enough that I was running close to the Erasmus University. But many people are saved through this way. And I think so the Dutch Heart Stifting is, is also an organization that has, yeah, like I said, it does a lot of great work, but, and, it, and it collects a fair amount of, of donation money. But I want to talk a little bit about donation money and the way how we, how we donate. And so this is not so much maybe about volunteering, but I think volunteering also has an, is an important, so it's, it's applicable to volunteering in an important sense, I think. So what happens in practice is that um, a lot of people give exactly to those, to those charities um, that they have some emotional connection to. So I also notice this in people who, who know me well, right? Like they, had the they also thought like, oh, is there something we can do? Can we give, can we give to, to this, this fund perhaps? And if you look at the idea, what, what this kind of like looks, uh, looks like in practice, so if you look at what do people give to, how do, how do people donate in the Netherlands? So these are the, the, biggest, the biggest funds um, that people donate to. And the biggest ones, so the very biggest one is, is, the, is the, by far, is, the, is a cancer fund that, that, that does this type of thing exactly for cancer. And I, and I think it's easy to understand why, right? Because many of us have lost loved ones way too early um, to cancer. And cancer is a tragic disease, and it's in many ways, of course, really good that people do that. So there's a couple of organizations also that do work abroad, so often to fulfill direct needs of, of things that we see on television, for instance. So Doctors Without Borders, also UNICEF, the Red Cross, but there is the Heart Fund as well, um, an organization that takes care of the national parks in the Netherlands um, and a worldwide uh, fund as well. So those are the type of organizations, and I think people often do altruism in this way. They follow their heart, and I think in many ways, of course, that that's a good thing, right? People, people, people want to do the right thing. They do what they, what they do, what they, what they, what feels right. And it turns out that the result is also great. There's a lot of money available now that goes to things that are that do good, that do good things. So if you talk about altruism, so altruism is something along the lines of doing something for the benefit of of others, right? But I think if we think about this, about the fact that we also want to benefit others. We should also think a little bit critically about the way how we do it and whether doing this emotionally, so doing this through what feels right, is always the best way to do that. So let me first start off by outlining just two, I think, ethical principles that almost I think everybody will accept. And the first one is that people's lives in the world are equally valuable. Right? So I, it doesn't matter where you're born, it's always a tragedy when something terrible happens to you. So if you die, when you're 30, uh, like I almost did, that's, that's, that's a really bad thing that almost happened to me. Um, but it's, of course, also a really bad thing if that happens to somebody who lives somewhere else. It's, it's in general, just a bad thing. And, and we shouldn't value the lives of some people over others. Uh, I think most people would, would agree with that. So I guess especially if, if we talk about altruism, it seems to go very strongly against that idea. And another one is, 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 is this one. So that the people who are maybe the worst off we have some reason to prioritize this. I, I, I'm curious what you think about this, but it seems to be that it seems to me that that people who are who are, who are, who are particularly struggling in life are the people who, who we have most reason to also help if we have the opportunity. But that also gives us, if we if we take these ideas seriously, that we sometimes want to. So especially in the context of giving, right? So when we when we donate money, we want to do something that's that's good. And we also abide by these two principles. But some of the results of a, of, of a strategy of just giving emotionally um, don't always seem to show that very well. And there are some really hard facts that I'm going to show, and some people 
that might not like that. But take, for instance, the, the idea of so for giving for a seeing, giving money to an organization that funds seeing eye dogs. Right? And I think nobody will, here will disagree that seeing eye dogs are a really great thing. They're a great help to people who are, who are, yeah, like unsuffer are suffering for no fault of their own, who can't see and can maneuver themselves sometimes for no fault of their own. And dogs can really help with this. But it costs a fair amount of, of money to do that. There's also a way how you can help blind people. And so you can, there's a, an infectious disease called tra trachoma. I have, also have to look at how you pronounce it because you never really hear about this. And it's something that causes blindness in developing countries. It's one of the most um, common preventable uh, ways that, in which people get, uh, get blind. Um, but a surgery that people can do that prevents blindness only costs about 20 euros, so maybe a little bit more, but something along those, something along those lines. But still, there is a lot of, so in both cases, right, there's not enough money available. So there's not enough money available to give everybody a seeing eye dog who might benefit from one, but the same goes for the trachoma surgery. So, and, and I think when we, I think what strikes me with, with these kinds of things is that there's something kind of odd about the fact that if we want to do something good, that way we then choose this option. Because with the same amount of money, you can actually help 1,500 more people. And remember, we thought that, at least as an ethical type of baseline, right? We think that every life is equally valuable. So blindness is equally bad for, for everyone. And then, but then it seems that you can only justify, if you're, if you're faced with this choice, right? You would, you would only just, it seems that you can only justify making choices like this if you, if you think that somehow the people who are suffering in, in countries where people get see, seeing eye dogs are somehow more important, which, which I think we don't. And in fact, you cannot only merely help them deal with their blindness, but you can actually prevent it. But of course, the problem is that a lot of it happens in countries that we don't really have a particular emotional connection to, at least not as direct as losing a family member or something happening to yourself. Trachoma doesn't seem to be a threat to us or to our loved ones. And if you, and if you follow the strategy of, well, I'm gonna kind of like do what feels right to me, then this is, I think, what happens. We, we, we will not really fund these types of, 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 of diseases that play a role here, but we will fund other things. All right. So remember, this is kind of, if we take these ideas seriously, it seems that we're almost not being really consistent with ourselves. Because we think that all lives are equally viable. And in fact, if anything, we should perhaps prioritize those people who are already suffering uh, more than us. And those are typically not people who live in, in wealthy countries. And so there's, there's, of course, some rationale to this. So why does follow your heart, why will it not always do the most good? So people in wealthy countries are typically emotionally connected to people who are, to other people in wealthy countries who are. And so wealthy nations have already more funds at their disposal, right? So there is already a lot more money here. And um, people in poor, poorer countries also face face more, more problems. So it makes sense that then, in the end, helping people in poorer countries is gonna be, in a sense, cheaper. You can, do, you can do more good with the same amount of, of money. Now, people tend to find this very uncomfortable, right? So thinking about these types of questions. And, and, and I think there's good reason to feel a little bit uncomfortable sometimes about these things, right? Because we don't want to weigh people. We don't want to say, we, we think all lives are equally valuable. And then it seems that when I'm comparing them, Perhaps I'm not treating them, so I, I actually seem to be kind of pointing out, seem to be almost saying that we should help some people rather than others, and that seems to be comparing them. But in fact, our implied choice, right? So if we, if we just do what feels right, our implied choice will actually kind of result in, in, in unfairness, right? So it will result in, in us, our actions, valuing people who are doing pretty poorly um, as, as valuing their issues as less important. And I think, of course, one of the things, one of the reasons I think why this is uncomfortable is that we think that altruism is not something that everybody necessarily has to do all the time, right? And maybe some people disagree, but a lot of people think, well, altruism is something that, and that, that philosophers call supererogatory. And supererogatory 
essentially means it's something that goes beyond the call of duty. There are certain things like when somebody here would faint, we all have a clear duty to help that person, but we don't have the same type of duty maybe to, I don't know, donate a lot of money. Now, if you're honest, it might be a bit different. Some people think that well, actually we do have, have some duty, but a lot of people think, well, it's actually something that it's not necessary to do, but it's something that's really good to do, something that's better to do than, than not to do. So why then criticize it? Right? Surely, I, like I talked about how great the work of the heart, the heart Stichting in the Netherlands, right? how great that is. And I think it is really great, and it saves lives. So why would you criticize it? And, I don't, and I, I don't really want to criticize that at all. But I do think that when we are making choices, it's good not always to fix on our emotional connection to things, but to take a little bit of a calculating stance sometimes as well, and to say, well, so what truly are my values, and how can I best serve those? And here's another comparison, for instance, about the AEDs. Right? So the AEDs are things that the heart stichting, the heart stichting funds that can save people, people's lives when, they're, when, when, they, uh, when their heart stops working, essentially. But you can also, so you, here is a comparison. So you, doing that, essentially, because these things are quite expensive and not all of them will be used to save one life, but there's, of course, a statistical calculation you'll have to do. So you have to buy a number of them and put them in particular places. And then ultimately, some of them will save lives. But the cost of doing so is about 24,000 euros. Then. So you can save a life. For tw so if you donate 24,000 euros to the heart sifting, and the heart sifting will fund, put all of that money into buying AEDs, you will have saved a life, which I think is really great. Something, somebody like me, right? So, so somebody who maybe doesn't know that they're sick and all of a sudden they, are, they, they, they need to be rescued and, and, and the A AEDs do, do that. And surely, I mean, this is a lot of beers, but those beers you'll be willing to forego if you can save a life. But the same you can also say about something as simple as malaria nets, right? So I, I, I know, so I, what I'm saying is not very surprising to people who already know a little bit about effective altruism. Right? But actually, it's just, it's, it's just so much cheaper. You can, you can just save 21 more lives. Uh, sorry, you can say seven, seven times more lives. I'm sorry. So, so eight, eight times more lives by, by, uh, by <laughs> sorry, <laughs> um, by, uh, by malaria. Right? So, and, 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 and I think we do have to take these things into account. When we're thinking about, okay, what is the best thing to do with our time and our money? Okay, so what I, do I really want to say? So I think giving is really, really great. And I think giving to every cause is, is a good thing. But that doesn't mean we should also not think a little bit critically about exactly who we are giving to. So what are questions we should be asking? So when you're thinking about your euro that you're giving away, or maybe 100 euros, it's, it's one thing is the size of the problem. So how many people can you help, people, can you help with, with that money? But it's also how much money is there already going towards that thing? So, and, and I think this is an issue, right, with cardiovascular disease, and, and it's, it's one of the, it's not only funded by donations, but it's also funded by government, and in particular, the pharmaceutical industry. They're, they're putting so much money into research already. How much money, how much difference will your euro really make there? And who are the people that are affected? Are, are they people who are already doing quite well, already get to live to the age of 50 most of the time, or are they people who might be dying from, in, very early, in very early ages? Or going blind, for instance, and even, even when they're still very young, for no fault of their, of their own. So I want to end here, and, I, and I'm, I'm very curious what you think about, think about this. But my, my, the point that I want to get across is that donating can do a tremendous amount of good. And I think it's really, really excellent if you, not only, not only donating money, right, but also donating your time. And I think that is you should, something you should be doing. And it's really great if you do it. But also, don't just make decisions on the basis, basis of like who comes at your door or the problems that you are emotionally connected to. <laughs> right, Willem, thank you very much. Uh, very thought-provoking. Uh, there are at the moment many discussions about, okay, we're opening up borders to Ukrainian refugees in Europe, but why didn't we do that towards Afghanian uh, refugees um, or Syrian refugees? And I think your uh, talk already addressed that question, uh, at least in part. Um, any questions? Yes, over there.
Thank you for the talk, it's really interesting. I'm a big fan of this movement of effective altruism, but I personally feel like that there's only a certain point, until a certain point where you can actually make the comparison. And um, for instance, um, there's one study suggesting that donors think that um, the, the receivers, they have lower psychological needs than physical needs, but actually the receiver think they're equally important. So my question really is, um, who got to decide what is more important for them, right? Like, you know, like it's usually us who are making this comparison as a donor. So maybe this is more important, this is more impactful, but actually it might not actually be the case. And I think that's also something that needs to be addressed. Yeah, so I think that's absolutely right, right? It's really difficult to make decisions, right? And I think people sometimes are also quite disappointed by how much money it's still, like you think, so there is, a, there is a serious money issue, right, in, 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 in Africa, a serious shortage of economic value, which is why some, some people's lives are lost. But people still are quite, I think, disappointed, rightly, that this is also still quite expensive, right? You still need to invest a lot of money, and, and there's a lot of uncertainty involved in those cases as well. And even there, right, we're comparing saving a life. And I think saving a life is maybe not something that's so hard to measure, right? but, but I think maybe you are also hinting at, at some other things. Like perhaps blindness for some people isn't as bad as we as we think it is. Uh, so some people, blind people, are actually not that bothered by it, while other people. Yeah, I'm just saying that, for example, there are something else than just saving a life. I guess some people might just want to prioritize their psychological needs or something, and so they might not want to risk their time and yeah, yeah. No, I, th I think that is right, and I think that's a challenge. I don't think it's, a, I don't think, so I think we always have to do things on what we have most reason to believe. And, and we don't always know, we don't always have proof, right? So it's not, we, don't, we always have to deal with uncertainty in our lives. But this is not really, a, I think this is not really an issue for, so just to be clear, I don't think this is an issue that's specific to comparing issues here, but it's in fact an issue whenever you're, you want to do something for other people, right? So you're always, whenever you want to help somebody and you're making a choice about how you want to help them, you're kind of judging it from your perspective and, and you, might be, you might not making an optimal, might not be making an optimal choice. We're judging it from a perspective, our own perspective. I guess that's the, one of the problems. I think yeah. like there's not a lot of voice from the receivers, what do we truly need, for example, from their perspective. And you're kind of like trying to quantify the impact that you can make with the money, but this still you're judging it from um, what you see as a donor instead, or right. the person with the money in, in a way. Yeah. I mean, of course, one way to solve that, if, if, so, if you, so it's true that, yeah, I mean, we're all necessarily tied to our perspective. So whenever we think we want to do something good, we, we do the thing that we think is, is the best, and that, that, that might not be correct. But if you, if you want to put more power in the hands of people who are not, uh, yeah, like as economically um, empowered as we are, you can always like, give di directly, right? So you, and then you put the economic power in their hands. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah, here. If you wait one minute for the microphone. Yeah, I really don't like microphones, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, from this presentation, I was um, feeling like you were saying like with the same amount of money, you can save more lives. So take that in consideration, it, yeah. right? Um, and, and it got me thinking because I feel like, but then you're prioritizing the group that's easier to help with less money. So maybe we should look at how many people from every group you can help but maybe that does cost a lot more money, right? So, yeah, what do you think about that? Yeah, th that's interesting. So I, I don't know, the question of course is how do you define a, a group, right? So you can, for instance, I don't know if you're think, having in mind countries, like we... You maybe not countries, but like a group of people with a, with a disease, so disease groups, like for, for example, the AID, yeah, that yeah. costs a lot of money, but then the, the, the illness for your, for your eyes is way less money, but then maybe, you want equal amount of people to benefit from yeah, yeah. from something. So, how many people can you save by actually donating to the EAD? So, yeah, I mean, it's a good. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's 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 a good question. But of course, one of the things you also have to realize is that uh, you're you're not really in charge. Nobody is really in charge of the distribution of all of the money that's being right. donated, right? So, it, you, it's only it's only you. You're making your choice about your money, and it's and it's good, of course, to have this 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 idea in mind, so you want to have maybe some equal opportunity and not this, because you happen to be born with some disease that is very cheap, then mm -hmm. all of the money will go there. But that's also not really the reality that we're, we're facing, right? right. Yeah. 
But, but it's a, it, that's a good thing to think about. Well, thank you very much, uh, Willem, and thank you for the questions. Um, maybe already started some more discussions on uh, altruism and volunteering. Um, so we first heard the, the management perspective on um, uh, what, what is volunteering and, and why do people volunteer, and then more the philosophical and ethical perspective, further going into what exactly is altruism and um, how can we be altruistic. And uh, now we go to a more psychological perspective. Huh? Um, so another Willem, uh, Willem Slegers. Willem used to be uh, assistant professor in social psychology here at our university, and now he became the senior behavioral researcher uh, or scientist for rethink. Yeah, scientist uh, for rethink priorities, which is a non-profit organization that conducts research on how to best help humans and animals. Um, so he's also going to help us more with the question: How can we be effective altruists? That's right. right. So, Willem, good luck. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, please give it up for him. <laughs> All right. Hey, everyone. Um, yeah, I'll briefly talk about effective altruism, I suppose. I mean, I'll, I'll definitely mention it a few times, uh, but I actually want to mostly just focus on the psychology of altruism and just get a, a, a better grasp of why we are altruistic. Now, I also realize that uh, I'll take the psychological perspective here, but you know what? I actually want to begin with a little bit of philosophy. And I want to talk about moral realism as sort of this position that there are these like true and false things about morality. Like some things are good and some things are bad, just like certain facts are true or false. And I think this is often how we talk about altruism. Like a certain behavior is really good or really bad. Like we should promote volunteering because it's really good. It's the right thing to do. But I think moral real realism doesn't make any sense. Like there's no reason to suppose it's true. I'm um, actually a little bit of a moral nihilist. Like I just don't think there's any right and wrong. I just think there is. And I want to kind of take you on board with that. So I'm, I'm going to see if I can convince you. So uh, let's see. I'll also have a few stories. They're also not good. But they are informative. So here, for example, we have a, a bird. It's a pretty cute bird, I think. It looks so innocent. Uh, but it's a cow bird. And what they do is they lay the eggs uh, of their own in the nests of others. And then they have the other birds take care of their offspring. And you might think, like, oh, well, I guess that's how nature works. It's fine. Um, but actually, it's not so fine, because what happens that, is that if the other bird knocks out the egg of this bird, then this bird will go back to that nest and kill everyone. So basically, they just blackmail other birds into taking care of their offspring. Well, that's, that's nature. Or take this uh, little critter. It's an insect, and um, it paralyzes caterpillars and then deposits, deposits their eggs inside the caterpillar, waits for them to hatch so it gets eaten from the inside while it's still alive. I told you these are great stories. <laughs> also, this is, this is how nature works. Like, this is, something, this is the stuff that we see in nature. And what I find so funny about this is that we, we don't label these things as good or bad. We just label them as they are. This is what these animals do. But you know what? The same applies to humans. So humans, they do these good things. They do these bad things. Like, they volunteer. They donate. These are the great things. But then they also um, you know, do bad things. They betray friendships. They cheat on people. They you know, start wars. So lots of bad things happen with that as well. And sort of the perspective I take here is like this stuff, yeah, this happens. <laughs> this is what it is. And I don't see it as right and wrong. I just see it as the things that happen. And I then want to know why or how does this work then? And we actually have a theory that can explain all of this, like the same as what humans do, as what we see with the other animals. And that is evolution. So evolution is this uh, change in heritable characteristics of biological populations over successive generations. Now, that's a, yeah, that's a description. I kind of like the description because it seems so dispassionate. It just like, it is what it is. It's just change. It's and it's blind. 
Like it just changed. It's not like towards a good direction, like towards greater good. No, it's just stuff that happens. And that's what I like about this description, that it reveals that it is a blind process. And that also explains so much then, because if it doesn't care about what happens, then anything can happen. So, or at least potentially everything can happen. And so it explains all these different life forms, all these different species that we see, and all of these different kinds of behaviors that they perform. And also that it just doesn't care if something is good or bad. It just cares about whether something leads to um, an increase in reproduction, so more generations. That's the only thing that matters. Now, why, why would I even like, start talking about this? Uh, because it seems so depressing. But I actually think there's an insane amount of value here because it offers us uh, better explanations. And I think there are, like it makes sense to talk about different types of explanations. So the first one is proximate, which are the ones that uh, I think we most often talk about. So these are explanations on the level of the individual. So why, why does a person perform a particular behavior? And I see that in previous talks today, or when we ask for like, why do you volunteer? We, set, we tend to see these kinds of explanations. Um, as a psychologist, we might also use these types of explanations. So here's an example. We label somebody as having a altruistic personality and therefore she volunteers. Like a, that's an explanation. Like she's the type that volunteers. Or perhaps, uh, here we have somebody uh, whose parents taught him to be kind and altruistic, and therefore he donates money. So that's also a particular explanation, but it's not satisfying to me at all, because I can still ask, well, why does she have an altruistic personality? And why did the parents teach them to be altruistic? So to me, these are not ultimate. Like I want the ultimate explanations so that I do not have to ask a follow-up why question. And that is, the evolutionary explanation. Because when we know how, some, how something evolved, then that is the reason why it happened. So those are the ultimate explanations, and I think we can also apply those to altruism. So I want to talk next about looking at altruism with the lens of evolution to see, can this explain why we do these nice things? That we at least label as nice. Evolution doesn't care. So there's a nice paper, a very recent paper by uh, Bastian Jaeger and Van Vircht. And they actually describe three reasons, three ultimate explanations for why altruism evolved. And these are parochialism, status, and conformity. So let's briefly go over these. So the first one, parochialism, it's, um, it's something very common. You probably have heard of this before. It's that we seem to have evolved to care about certain people more than others. So we care more about kin, which is basically another word for family. So we care definitely a lot more about our own children, for example, or our parents or grandparents or nephews. Like we care more about them compared to just any random other person. But not just family, also interdependent others like friends. We definitely care about our friends. They're very important to us. Um, and so we care more about them than just a stranger. But also just generally, those who are more similar to us, we care more about. So those who share the same color of our skin, the ones who speak the same language, uh, this have the same values, we just seem to care more about them than we care about others. So this we can also label as, we care more about those who are more like us compared to them. And yeah, we see this. Uh, it was already uh, briefly mentioned today that we see it with the current war in Ukraine. We see, for example, these tweets here that all of a sudden now we care more about Ukraine because uh, it's no longer in those impoverished and remote populations. No, this is close by. Or these are white people, so we must care more uh, because they're more similar to us. Now, I, I strongly disagree on a personal level, but again, it's does reveal uh, that we, or at least, at least some of us, they seem to think along these lines of us versus them and we care more about those who are similar. And we also see this in research on exactly the topic of moral concern. So when we vary systematically the social distance between people, 
then people actually rate those who are closer to them as deserving of more moral concern. And this is not because of distance. Distance doesn't mean anything. But it tends to be confounded with certain attributes like group membership. So the ones who are closer to you tend to be part of your own group, while those very far away, they are probably not in your group. So, you have, so then you don't have to care as much. So if you control for those things, then you indeed you see that it's factors like group membership that affect whether people think that someone deserves moral concern. We also see it in the way we donate. We donate uh, more to local charities than we do to international charities. And that's a bit of a bummer because we can actually do more good, as was also uh, seen in the previous talk, by actually donating to international causes, like for example, not to seeing eye dog support, but actually to uh, the sarcoma operations. And also a nice example is Give Directly, which also shows uh, on their website that they can actually do more good with your money in particular countries because with Give Directly, you can just donate money and then that money will directly go to the donors so that the donors can decide what to do with it. And you can actually do that better if you donate to those who are really poor compared to those who are less poor. But that is not a tendency that we seem to have. We just care more about us than them. So that's the first, parochialism. Now the second is status. And I have to admit, <laughs> I was a little bit surprised by some of the reasons some of you gave for volunteering. Like it seemed to reek of status to me. And like you do it for personal reasons, to get certain benefits yourself and to be liked and stuff like that. And you know, yeah, that is indeed what humans are like. Humans respond to reputational incentives. Like they have a particular reputation, meaning people think of a certain way about them and we want that to be positive. Like we want people to like us. As, and this is usually irrelevant in a particular group because that means that you will become the leader or um, in a particular group there are other people and you want to be a friend with certain people. And if you are indeed better in like nicer, then you will be selected more as like a friend or a leader or even a date. So we care about that uh, for all of various benefits like resources, like uh, getting favors from people or even protection or like I mentioned, um, mates, which is actually just romantic partners. You'll, you're actually more attractive if you're nicer um, compared to when you're you know, a dick, then people just don't like that. And again, supported by research. So we see that if we ask people like a bunch of traits and then ask them like, okay, how much do you value that trait in a person? Then we see that being altruistic is uh, very much regarded as a very positive trait to have. They're also preferred as social partners. So if you get them into the lab, you uh, design this like game where people have to like pick partners, then you actually see that if you were nice, then actually you increase the chances of being picked to work together in subsequent tasks. And you actually reap then the benefits of being included, even when you were initially like sacrificing yourself by being altruistic. But you would then reap the benefits later. This can even lead to something called competitive altruism, which is just this funny notion, like uh, here we're talking about something nice, but now it's all of a sudden a competition of being nice, uh, which is a very weird notion, but it, it basically means you try to be nicer than somebody else so that you will be liked more than the other person. So you're just competing in being nice, which is just hilarious to me. Now, Little bit, uh, going a little bit back to the, uh, this, this status issue. So let's take this very concrete example. Suppose that Laura donates $100 to the Malaria Consortium. Now, what do we think of this? And there are two main factors that we can look at. The first one is uh, the, the sacrifice. So Laura sacrificed $100. So that was the personal cost. Okay, so that's great, that's, that seems admirable. But what about the effect? So this donation then resulted in four children uh, not getting malaria. So that seems pretty great too. So maybe we should really like Laura because of that, the social benefit, not the cost. So what do people pay more attention to? The fact that she sacrificed the money yeah. or the effect? Turns out it's the costs, not the benefits. 
So if you systematically vary like a particular situation and then the, the effects are better or worse or it costs more or less, then we see that people track the costs more than the actual benefits of the act, which is insane if you are concerned about doing good. Uh, but it makes a lot of sense in other ways. You also see it here, like here's an example of another tweet. This was uh, Jeff Bezos donating $100 million to uh, help the homeless, so that's great. But then somebody comments, uh, yeah, great that this person donated 0.04% of his income. <laughs> As if it then all of a sudden doesn't like produce these insane amounts of good. Now, of course, he might be a jerk for other reasons, but I would say that this is great. Now, this idea is actually called costly signaling, like the fact that you sacrifice something and then reap certain benefits. It's not even unique uh, to humans, definitely not. Uh, we also see it in the peacock. Like the tail, it's insane. It's a completely useless thing almost. Like it's, it's huge and it's very unwieldy to move around in. But it indicates that you're able to actually still survive while having this annoying tail. So it's, and that is very attractive in a mate. So that's actually why peacocks still survive. Same with humans. We can sacrifice and thereby indicate actually how strong we really are. And that's called costly signaling. And it's then something we value. Now, finally, there's conformity. So we um, have also evolved to just copy people's behaviors, uh, which makes a lot of sense, of course. And we do it for definitely two big reasons. And one is that it helps us figure out complex situations. If we can just copy what other people are doing, then we don't have to think. Great. Or it also helps us to be liked. Like if we just do what others are doing, then of course they must like that, which means they'll like us. Now, we see this also with donations. We see that people don't actually think a lot about uh, how to do good. They, they tend to go for yeah, the things that are personally, personally connected to them, but they're not really delving into, like the, on the internet and then comparing all of the different uh, charities and see which ones are the most effective. We actually don't seem to do that. We also see that they donate more when they see that other people are donating. So there's like uh, some nice studies where they have these empty boxes and then they vary how much money is in there. And then uh, you see in these conditions where there already is some money, people actually end up donating more because they see like, oh, apparently I'm supposed to donate. So I'll donate. And they even match the money that's in the boxes. So they donate more coins here and more bills here. So it's like very funny how they are sensitive to these social cues to donate rather than just you know, decide whether this is something uh, that they care about. So I think these examples show us that we're not driven to be like super effective altruists. I think instead that these results support that we're mostly driven by other fundamental motives. So we're, and then I should say, like, not that we are not motivated by altruistic motivations. We, clearly we are. But apparently it's not fundamental really, because if, if we really care about altruism, we should be effective. And we, like, we should have way more tendencies that also uh, promote being very effective altruists. But instead we seem to be a bit more lax in that regard. And we, we seem to be focused on other aspects instead. And I cover three of them, the parochialism, status, and conformity. Now, I think this is important to realize. Like it's, I think it's important to take this perspective that there might be these fundamental motives that underlie our behavior because then we can optimize it. So I think, one, to talk about like realistic moralism makes no sense. Like I don't think we can expect people to just do the right thing as if there is this, this right thing that we all agree on because I don't think we do. Now, I think it's better that we take into account these other motives and then play into them. So. Perhaps we should emphasize the similarities between people and like really try to get everybody to see others as similar to them so that they care more. And here I wanna pitch something like sentientism, which is the view that for something to be morally relevant, the only thing you need is to be sentient. You just need to be able to feel pain and pleasure and then you're morally relevant because apparently you can feel bad and that sucks. So we should care. A rock doesn't tend to feel anything, so do whatever you want with a rock. But everything else that can feel things, it seems to be very important and morally relevant. Perhaps also we should just reward people more if that is clearly why they are being altruistic. And we already do this in some capacity, like donations are tax deductible. 
you know, that's not super sexy as a reward. It's sort of nice, but I think we can do a lot more to reward people for their super kind behavior. And also to make it easy. Like we should make it easy because it is hard. Uh, like we are still lazy in some capacity and some things are difficult to figure out. So we should make it as easy as possible so that they donate to the right causes, particularly the effective ones. And now I want to end uh, with just one important final thought because I realize that uh, this whole evolutionary talk by me is like super depressing and uh, as if I have this like super negative view of people. That's not true. Um, or sort of it is, but you know, it is what it is. Like, I'm, I'm just motivated to give you the correct answer and not a particular view of the world. So that's the first motive. Um, but then I do want to like stress that we should be very lucky like, because evolution doesn't care, right? Anything can happen. But now it turns out that evolution has stumbled upon us humans that give a shit. Like we actually care about other things. Like we have the capacity for, for empathy and sympathy, and that's amazing. Like, it didn't have to happen. And that's why it's uh, just so cool that it did happen. Just why I find humans still so amazing and not negative. Like, I don't think they're dead. No, they're great. Um, but I do want to say that we have to get better at, at being nice. All right, that's what I had. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Willem. Questions? No, then I have a question. Uh -huh. Isn't it a bit of contradiction that you know, <laughs> if it's just evolutionary and it is what it is, then why should we get better? Uh, yes, very good because question. Because that is normative. That's true. Um, so my response to that is a little bit Descartian, if I may. Uh, there's no doubt that good feelings feel good and bad feelings feel bad. Um, so at least on an individual level, I am definitely motivated to do the things that end up feeling good rather than bad. And then I think all else being equal, if I can do something that feels good, like if I get rewarded for my good and I produce good elsewhere, then it seems better to have that rather than something else. But then I think you should talk with Willem because this is actually plea for pursuing the things that do feel good. Yeah, yeah, than I definitely. what is good, right? Oh yeah, no, it has to feel good. Like I don't think there's any denying that, um, like we simply cannot expect people to be super sac uh, super sacrificial. Like they should do things that come easy to them, or at least we should make it as easy as possible. We have to make sure that they indeed care about it, that they feel passionate about it. But like those are all nice bonuses. It's like the whole idea, the whole thing why why humans are amazing is that they actually care. Like empathy is just a trick to get you to do nice things, and as a result, you feel good about it. If we don't have that empathy, then actually it's not going to happen. So this alignment is what we need and is what we need to promote as well. Okay. Uh, Willem, you do have a <laughs> reaction? Uh, I, I, I do. I, I, I think moral realism is true. So I think, think you're wrong there, but, but I don't really want to talk to you about that at all. I, <laughs> <laughs> you just want me to know. Okay. Um, no, I have a question about so the idea that altruism is So you said it's, it's one of the things that motivates us, but it isn't particularly fundamental. And I'm, I'm kind of just kind of curious on what grounds you can really make that basis. Cause that, so I remember this, this episode from Friends, right? Everybody knows that with it's- With Phoebe. It, you know, yeah. Phoebe, and then Phoebe lets a, bing sting her, a bee sting her, but it turns out that then a bee dies. And it's very hard to, to observe altruism kind of like in, in the purest form or whatever. Um, but it's also in general just very difficult to really know, I mean, what truly motivates people, right? And it seems to me that altruism is always kind of mixed in there. People do want to do things that are good for others, it, it seems. And, and then it, it seems to me like, and surely status is always involved as well. But uh, so why do you say that status is somehow more fundamental than, than, altruis than altruism? Because it seems to me a bit puzzling. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, first thing, I think this is funny coming from the effect of altruism. <laughs> because uh, it's as a result so obvious that we clearly are not uh, fundamentally driven by like pure altruism in any sense or like true altruism. I know. But uh, that's sort of my point though. Like the fact that we are not super effective altruists means there are other motives at play rather than the altruism itself. That's one. Uh, the second thing I wanna say about that is that the distinction between proximate and ultimate explanations, uh, you can very easily confuse them. Like 
uh, status could be just approximate explanation as well. Like, oh, I want to uh, volunteer because I know I'll be liked. Uh, or I know there's a, a girl that also does it. And you know what? I'm going to do it and then get these benefits as well. And then, that's, then we're actually talking about the proximate level. But then um, to me, that's then still not really satisfying because then I'm like, okay, but why is this then um, appealing to you? Like, why do you want this status? And then the, we do get eventually to the evolutionary story, and then that's why it's ultimate. Because, that, and because then I will not ask the why anymore because evolutionary explanations are just like, oh, this thing randomly happened, it gets selected for, and that is the answer to the question. I think we can have a Willem versus Willem debate uh, <laughs> for the rest of the day. Uh, but time's up. I want to move on. So thank you very much, Willem. All right. And I want to ask the four uh, persons from the four Shund organizations to come forward. You know, I've, what I very much like is that sometimes we have these sessions and then we have speakers and they are all like, oh, I agree with you. Yes, I agree with you. And they basically say the same. And now we really had three really different speakers. So I think that was already great. Uh, and much food for thought, so in the end we are curious to hear your input. But first, we're going to turn to these four persons. Um, so they all represent a different st student organization. They all volunteer themselves, uh, but also make an appeal on other students, as in you, to volunteer with them, I guess. Uh, so we're briefly going to hear from them who they are, what organization they represent. And my question is, why should they volunteer with you? Um, and then we have a few uh, statements that we're going to discuss first with them, but then also with you uh, on this topic. So, Johan, can I start with you? Sure. I'm, uh, I'm Johan. I'm a master student here at uh, Tilburg University, and I'm here uh, for VFUD, a Christian Student Association uh, here, on, uh, here in the city. Um, yeah, why, why you should volunteer with us? Well, because it's, uh, it's a social use. So, so because it's uh, useful for the society and because uh, it's great fun, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm Lois, I'm a, a bachelor's student in uh, sociology and also uh, I'm volunteering at uh, Service City Tilburg. Um, yeah, it's uh, uh, Service City Tilburg does uh, various activities for uh, people in Tilburg. Um, I think it's a, lo uh, a lot of fun to meet other students but also other people in Tilburg. Um, I'm in a group that uh, does activities for elderly, so it also feels really good to do something for society. Uh, yeah, and it's a lot of fun also. Okay. Hi, my name is Tessa. I'm a student of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and this year also Vice Chairman of the Student Party SAM, uh, where we represent the over 20,000 students of Tilburg University in the University Council. And of course, you should volunteer with us because you're most likely a student yourself and by working with us uh, and you can help us find initiatives to actually improve the study climate and improve the university to your own benefit. Hi, I didn't know <laughs> knew we had to promote ourselves, but uh, hi, <laughs> I'm Malou. Um, I will be uh, representing the Red Cross today. Uh, I'm the chairman of the Red Cross Student Desk and it's a charity organization um, led by students. It's a branch of the Red Cross. Um, yeah. I love humans, just as Willem says. Um, and if you do as well, jo join the Red Cross or something. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Did, did, did you already keep track of the reasons why you should help volunteering? Huh? So it started off with, it's fun, it's fun. So that definitely taps into the uh, your own feeling argument and it gradually went more into do good for society. Uh, so depending on what you're interested in and where on the level of altruism you are, I think uh, you know now which organization to join. Um, let me go to the clicker thing. So we have four statements, um, but it may be a bit too much to discuss all of them. So I want move to move to the second. Because one of the big debates is, does pure altruism exist? Uh, and, and the whole discussion on like, okay, yeah, you can be altruistic with us because it's also fun already taps into the question, is it really altruistic? So. Imagine, here's a case for all of you, imagine that you are taking care of someone close to you who has serious addiction problems and is looking for the next fix and damages everyone around them in the process. Could continuing to care for such a person be valid evidence of real altruism? Somehow I have to think of the Red Cross, I don't know why. <laughs> what do you think? Um, 
Okay, there are multiple factors <laughs> because it's a friend, um, right? Yeah, someone who's close to you. Um, so I think that kind of altruism is different than, for example, if you um, apply this case on uh, on a group of uh, addicts, for example. Is this uh, evidence of altruism? In a way, it is. I think it is if you continue caring for someone. But um, I don't know, maybe someone else can start off because I didn't have time to think. But uh. No problem, maybe serve the city. Yeah, You're also trying to help homeless people, among others, and addicts. Um, well, first of all, I think it's uh, up to debate what care for means. Um, because you can care for someone um, by doing what they want, uh, what but, but also what they really need, and maybe they don't know themselves what they need. So, yeah, it's quite a difficult question uh, also because what care for means. Um, and also if you're altruistic, if that means um, just for one person, for this friend, or for the other ones. So, yeah. You can notice that we're at the university when we don't start to answer the question, but we're just discussing definitions. Uh, what do we exactly mean? Um, why is it important? Because w whenever you talk about something, you want to know what you're talking about in the first place. Because if I'm talking about uh, you care for someone, that means I oh, just care about them, I think about them from time to time. And care for means taking care of them, like uh, giving them medicine, being next to them all the time. That's two different things. I mean. Thank you very much. I mean, I'm, I'm, I was a bit skeptical, but of course my, my professorship hat is really happy now that all of you are such good students. Um, let's, let's, just, let's just do a raise of hands then. Who of you thinks that if you continue to care for such a person that really is pure altruism? Pure altruism, yeah. true altruism. altruism. Yeah, yeah, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, great, thanks. Um, could you briefly elaborate or explain why? Um, yeah, I think because the intention is there, like maybe it's not effective altruism and maybe they don't, don't go the extra mile to find out what's good, um, assuming that we're not speaking about tough love. But then the intention was there to do good, so I think it speaks of altruism. Okay, thank you, the, the intention matters. Anyone who really disagreed? Who wants to explain why? Ah, there in the back. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't have to be pure altruism. It could be duty or avoiding shame or some kind of overarching benefit that they're getting from it. It doesn't have to be altruistic at all. Okay, thank you. That's, I guess, the more nihilistic perspective that we're getting back again, huh? I think I think Willem will be proud. Um, let's go to uh, let's go to the next question because we have here uh, fraction Sam as well. And um, um, uh, when you get into volunteering, one of the things we discussed um, in the several in the different talks was that we tend to sometimes want to volunteer and help other people, but then also we want to help some people more than others. Uh, some people are more worthy of taking care of. And of course, as a more political organization, if I may position you a little bit like that, you may also sometimes perhaps look more after some people than towards others. So how do you look at this? I mean, I guess so, because uh, of course, as a student organization, we look more towards what's beneficial for students. Um, and sometimes we may forget to look at what's beneficial for professors or staff of the university. Um, so. Yeah, of course, there's always some sort of perspective. Um, you're representing a group of people. You're thinking about what do they want, what do they want to achieve, um, what can be bad for them. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you want to do the best for everyone, of course, it's important to not be too political. You have to look at what's the view for everyone. And it was also the case, I think, in the former case, um, where we said about helping a friend um, who's actually sort of demolishing everything around them uh, because of their addiction. You have to ask yourself, is what you're doing truly helping them or are you doing this because they are that person? Um, I mean, yeah, it's 
all the questions, it has many different aspects as well. Uh, but I think it's important to not be too political. But of course, there, it's also important that you do have a stance and that there's representation on behalf of every group. Uh, I mean, we can't represent both the student and the uh, maybe the staff perspective. So uh, I guess in a sense, it is great that there are parties who represent these certain people because they're in close contact, maybe because they have these same beliefs. Uh, so yeah, that's what I see. All right, well, and then if I can uh, uh, link it again a bit to the war that we at the moment have, uh, uh, and, and then to the Red Cross, let me this time give you a little bit more time to think. Uh, <laughs> um, for the Red Cross, should they be political? Should they make a decision on whether or not they support Ukraine, or should they be open to both Ukraine and Russia, no matter what? Ooh, with the yeah, with the <laughs> Russian example, that's more difficult. But um, as speaking of the the Red Cross, the organization itself, um, one of its fundamental uh, principles is that it's uh, impartial and it's uh, neutral. Um, and also, if we see, if you look into our history, I think it's very important that um, the Red Cross remains this neutral party and this impartial party, yeah, party uh, organization um, to help everyone and to not choose a side. Because if you choose a side, for example, the political side, you uh, automatically uh, leave out others. Um, and I. Uh, yeah, now you, you, they had a, a campaign where they raised money for uh, Ukraine and to yeah, help uh, Ukrainian uh, refugees. I think that's really important, but I do think if we strive for this um, impartiality and this neutrality, that we also need to um, help uh, all parties, so Russia in this example as well, um, in certain ways. I don't know yet how. Um, but <laughs> the conclusion is the beauty of the organization is to help everyone and to not exclude, exclude someone um, or groups of people. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, Johan, and I'm turning to you because uh, representing a Christian uh, organization, um, wouldn't you say that you are primarily serving those who are Christian and who have the same identity and therefore are also quite political? Yeah, in a way, in a way, we we cater to the to Christian students and people who are interested in Christian religion and Christianity as a whole. So, in that sense, we are kind of political, if you want to call it like that. Um, uh, but we are in, the, in that sense not per se a charity organization like the Red Cross. So I don't think that's in our case that is a problem. I think uh, as long as you respect other parties that that can be an addition and can be an an, uh, an, an added value to, for example, university life in this case. Um, and overall, I think um, that a charity organization, like you said, will always have some kind of political uh, value or angle because you're operating from an, from an ideology and that ideology can be neutrality. So every life matters as much as anyone else, even if it's Russian or Ukrainian for that example uh, but you're still working from an, a, a, a perspective a framework so you're always having some kind of political ideological uh, way of thinking that that uh, is fundamental to your organization so in my opinion is it important for charity not to be political I think it depends on what you want to do but you will always will be in some sense okay thank you very much anyone here who has very strong thoughts on this statement Wants to, yeah, there in the back. Let me go towards you. Um, yeah, I think it can be idealistic to say that we should never have a political um, ideology for charity because at the end of the day, like humans are motivated by specific, you know, intrinsic drives. And for a lot of people, that's going to be a political cause. Like if you're, you know, if it's for fellow Christians or for fellow any religion or any race or um, whether you're helping people because you're similar to them or because you uh, you know, know someone who is impacted by that I think politics are always going to drive people and that it's a bit idealistic to claim to ever be completely neutral because it would be impossible to justify why you're doing things so, so if I understand you correctly you say it's actually your identity and your politics that can drive you to become 
altruistic, right? Um, I have to this time go completely to the back. It's good for my exercise. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, I think it's also depending on what kind of charity it is. It's, it's a little bit uh, what you said also. But also, I think it's about the cause, uh, the, the goals you have with your charity, whatever politics or non-politics you, you have, I think. So I think that's also important. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I suggest that we then move on to the next statement. And that has to do with a recent report by the United Nations Volunteers Program. Uh, Flynn, you may be uh, familiar with this one. Um, I don't know if you even wrote it yourself, but um, it shows that in Europe, women take on most of the volunteer work at around 66%. Why is that? I guess, well, Lois, I mean, so I have some connection with Serve the City, and so I sometimes see what you're doing, and what strikes me is that it's always women over there, um, which may be a reason for men to also volunteer, but then it's not altruistic, I guess, anymore. But <laughs> why do you think that is the case, that there are so many women who take part in Serve the City? Um, well, yeah, I think that's quite a difficult question. Um, I see at Serve the City, uh, most of them are women, there are men, of course. Um, yeah, maybe uh, for me on a personal note, um, uh, maybe historically uh, women did more um, uh, part-time work and men more full-time work. Now it's not that uh, uh, black and white anymore. Um, but I think maybe uh, sometimes uh, when you uh, daughters look more towards their mothers and uh, sons more towards their fathers, I think maybe that can be an explanation. I don't know for sure, um, yeah, but uh, it's always um, interesting uh, to see uh, why this is and yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay, Milou, you raise your hand, you want to weigh in? Yeah, yeah. Um, because I think it's a shame that not a lot of men do volunteer work and indeed we also see it in our organization. Uh, so, man, come on. Um, but uh, <laughs> I think it's also um, maybe in a sense that um, it's kind of a, s a stereotype that women are the care caregiving persons and maybe history-wise as well. And that's this stigma around women doing volunteering work that maybe leave men um, yeah, outside that. But they, I don't know what this this gender did. <laughs> I'm not the perfect person for a panel because my mind goes. Duh, 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 duh. Um, so yeah, I, uh, yeah. I, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Feline, you also focus in your research on volunteering inclusion. Is there anything you have to say about this or can say? Well, I'm kind of surprised by this actually because if we look at the numbers in the Netherlands, we see that it's kind of similar. But, and why I think it's interesting that you all see it in your organizations, or at least you said so and, and you said so, I think, might depend on the kind of volunteering work that you're offering and the beneficiaries that you're serving. Because what we're seeing, for example, is that in the Netherlands, men do a lot of volunteering in boards and in sports, <laughs> and women do a lot of volunteering in uh, schools and in um, healthcare, for example. So those are big differences. And here with the UN, I'm wondering what they count as volunteer, um, volunteering hours, because sometimes what also is included in volunteer hours is voluntary care and voluntary housework. And if we of course look at care and housework, then we still see a very big imbalance and we see that women take most care of that. I wonder, I, I don't think the UN will actually do that. I hope not, but yeah. So we go from questions about definitions, about questions about methods <laughs> and operationalizations. Uh, are there any men here who have any thought on the matter? Or? Um, I think it's quite interesting also, and there's research on um, how, you know, men are especially uh, resistant to adapt um, to eat vegetarian cuisine, for example. And I think like in this paper, they suggest that it's because this signaling of being vegetarian or signaling of helping is considered to be warm or gentle or feminine. And men 
a lot of men don't want them to be associated with this kind of like stereotypes or so on or you know and i think it's particularly something we can work on because you know helping is not supposed to be feminine it's gender neutral it should be <laughs> i hear some people applauding <laughs> quietly so i think people agree i think this was also the point that you were trying to make right uh, yes so thank you i think uh, i think this this case has been dealt with so we have a last one um, well, it has been perfectly addressed, right? So the last one is that uh, nowadays we are used to receiving financial compensation for our work, which may prevent many people from starting to volunteer. However, one thing that I learned from today is that actually you can get paid while volunteering. <laughs> Great when you're a student, especially. Um, but um, uh, as we also know from research is that the moment that you start to pay people for something, they don't want to do it for free anymore. So that means that it can also cause um, volunteering to become not so attractive. So how can we make sure that volunteering still remains attractive to as large a group of possible, um, even if we don't pay them? Is there anyone in the audience who has any ideas on this matter? Yes. I first go there and then I go there. I think that as much as we want true altruism, you can get more volunteers by playing up all the other reasons people volunteer. So emphasizing that you're going to feel good about yourself and you can build up your, your CV, you can make friends, that all the other reasons that we already use to volunteer, if we emphasize those, it'll encourage more and more people to volunteer because true altruism evidently doesn't do enough if we're just saying help because it's the right thing. So, yep. Well, there needs to be something in it for them, right? Uh, all right. This way. I think it has a big connection with seeing the results by yourself, like working on something and giving all your power and involvement and time and emotions and then being able to see the results that you're, you're actually, you've achieved. I think that's really, really important, at least in my case. Okay, so also looking back and seeing like, hey, what has it brought you and what has it given to you? Ah, to the others as well. Okay, um, Johan, you have a... Yeah, I would like to react. I think it's also the other way around. We are nowadays re used to receiving financial compensation. People also have to survive, have to work for their money. I think that's also partially why you see in your research that uh, uh, people who are volunteering are mostly univers uh, university educated and rich because they have more time, they have more opportunity to volunteer. So I think if you want to make volunteering more attractive, I would say that supporting the, uh, the lower side of the society from governmental standpoint will make also uh, more time available for volunteering because people don't have it on their minds because they're busy with paying rent and surviving. So that was something I wanted to add. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, at some, you, you do get paid, right? When you are part of the school council among others <laughs> right uh, how how important is that part you think among your volunteers <laughs> so, <laughs> so um yeah our council members do indeed get paid we have a lot of very ambitious and hardworking committee members that do in fact not get paid which are still do very much willing to do a lot of work for us um how important is it that we get paid um I don't think it matters that much. Honestly, when I was recruited for doing a board here, I didn't know I was going to get paid. Um, and I think, you know, you already sort of said it, but you really have to sort of target things to the specific group that you want to volunteer, that you want to work with. I think students generally are not a group that have a lot of money to maybe donate, uh, but they are a group that may be willing to provide help in other ways. Um, yeah, to, to give to the community. So instead of giving money, they'll volunteer. And I think you can play on these intrinsic factors. So the fact that humans are naturally, I believe at least, uh, inclined to help others, but also provide extrinsic factors. So uh, students are very busy with preparing themselves for the labor market. Nowadays, we have to make ourselves look more and more unique to be attractive to companies. And I think actually providing things that give a, give a status, such as a better CV, uh, building up a network at these organizations, is something that can motivate this specific group of students very much. 
<laughs> yeah, you can ask her something. <laughs> um, so if we implement the effective altruism in it, let me ask you a question. <laughs> Are you prepared to, for example, um, donate the money you get for your board year to charity? Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> I must say, look, the thing is, um, we do get money for our board year indeed. And I don't use it for like a lot of my personal things. Of course, I use it to buy food because otherwise I wouldn't be standing here right now. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I think we put a lot of the money that we get from the university actually into the work that we do. So in a sense, we put the money we get from the university back into representing those students and doing that well. So I guess sort of, yeah, yeah. I am very happy that you buy food <laughs> for yourself, yes. Very altruistic, maybe not pure altruistic, but it's very good. Um, it's about time to, ra to uh, wrap up. Uh, so first, let me thank very much the four students standing here. Please give them a very big ovation. I want to thank the three speakers, Fleen and Willem and Willem. Um, So, among other things that I learned today is that there are many different types of volunteering, many different reasons why people volunteer. You can even get paid for volunteering, as mentioned, and then it's still called volunteering, as long as you get paid less. But I guess it's not the same as doing an internship. Um, so I still do have some questions there. Um, I learned that we tend to be altruistic towards what feels good. Um, and what we have an emotional connection to, but that, that also prevents us from being very effective volunteers and making the world a better place so we can maybe sometimes think a bit harder about how can we really be effective volunteers. I also learned today that apparently altruism may be the result of evolution. It helps us surviving and as a consequence we can even compete in being the best altruists. How cool is that for all of us who are somewhat competitive. Um, Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much for your participation and for weighing in into the discussion. I hope uh, you will continue the conversation uh, when you go away from here. Um, and we very much look forward to seeing you at the next event from Studium Generale. Thank you very much.